Looking forward, looking back. Kaya, Wanju. Hello and welcome in Yunga. As a Yunga, Wanga, and Yamaji man standing before you, I thank Birawura for her warm welcome this evening. I also acknowledge the Gurenji people who are here tonight, but your elders past and present. I formally acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand, the Larrakia people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Good evening to all of you who have joined us this evening, and in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, my brothers and sisters who many that, that I've walked the challenges of change with. The words of a song that was sung by the much-loved Slim Dusty of looking back and looking forward was the basis for what I wanted to cover tonight because of several reasons. But Slim in particular was loved by Indigenous Australians. Slim was a storyteller. Since the beginning of our time, our nation's sacred knowledge and identity has been kept and shared in song and in transmission through our stories. Song is important to our culture and to Australian culture. Music and the stories presented through songs are understood and loved by all Australians. In Slim's case, his songs were heard drifting throughout Australia's living rooms, pubs, town halls and on the old wireless radio and through the records we played. Through his songs and storytelling, Slim brought Indigenous Australia into suburbia, into the minds and hearts of the nation and the wider Australian culture. The words you would have heard in his song, looking forward, looking back, are very poignant and help paint an image of modern day Australia. I won't sing it to you <clears throat> because I would sort of distract from the quality of the music. But as Sim Slim says, looking forward, looking back. We've come a long way down the track. We've got a long way left to go. Indigenous Australians, in everything we do, draw on the insights of our journey, the knowledge and wisdom of the past, and use that to embrace our future generations. As we look back, we see the tracks of those who've walked before us. For each of us, looking back evokes different memories and experiences. But I want us about to look forward, together, with a united purpose and determination for our children and grandchildren. And whilst for us as well, we have lived our time. That's why I'm here with you at the 19th Annual Lingari Lecture. Tonight I will outline how I see us walking together to advance local truth-telling, constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians, giving voice to local communities and addressing disadvantage in Indigenous Australia. So why did I start with Slim? I'm told that back in the day there were jukeboxes here in the Territory that had nothing but Slim Dusty records on them. And as a Slim Dusty and Country Western fan, music fan, I can certainly understand that sentiment. But the thing that I really admired about the man was he sang about the land, about country, about people, and our Australian way of life. He sang about us and to us, travelling in the old purple with his caravan to many remote communities and country towns across Australia. Slim once said the most valuable performance fee he ever received in his entire career was the fee paid by a young girl called Miriam from Daly River here in the Territory. Miriam and the children of the Daly River Mission wanted to see Slim perform, but they couldn't travel to Darwin to see him. So together they saved up some money and wrote to Slim, offering him an attractive performance fee if he came to their town. The performance fee they offered was $5.00 but that was good enough for Slim. He came to Daly, accepted the fee and put on a show. Over the course of his life, he visited that community many times. He'd go out to the mustering camp for dinner and share their black tea and woolly beef sandwiches. He'd watch and learn as the women and children showed him how to look 
for Minamindi. He learned how to cook with the honey bag the kids brought back from the wild bees. He fished with them. He went shooting with them. He was invited to corroborates and learned how to make ochre paint. Knowing us and really knowing us meant he could sing about us. He could share our stories in ways we didn't have the means to. And he could tell us stories of other places and people that helped to, us to understand our neighbours around us. He sang of Trumby, the ringer who couldn't read or write. He sang of the tall dark man in the saddle and of the painter, Albert Namajira. He sang of a man called Bundawal, a king without subjects or crown, a tribal elder reflecting on past struggles and glories who couldn't stop an alien race without pity or grace eradicating his people. The song was based on a story that the local Aboriginal people told Slim while he was on tour. He was singing about this when hardly anyone else in Australia were talking about us in the same way that he sang. Slim opened the door for Indigenous people themselves to share the stage in the Australian country music industry. Some of these early Indigenous pioneers in the country music industry were people like Oriel Andrew, Jimmy Little and Gus Williams, just to name a few. Picture a time in Australia, and this is for all the young ones out there, because many of us here tonight know what it's like to be told where we could and could not sit, where we could and could not go. You couldn't sit on a seat at the cinema. You had to sit on a milk crate at the front of the auditorium or the old chairs. You couldn't enter a pub. But Slim Dusty's concerts were open to all and we could sit wherever we liked. People like Slim helped shift the pendulum. Throughout our history, advancements in Indigenous affairs have swung like a pendulum. This pendulum has shifted back and forth, sometimes bringing meaningful advancement for Indigenous Australians through events and actions of our own people, such as Albert Namajira becoming the first Indigenous Australian to be given restricted citizenship, Charlie Perkins' freedom right, the election of Neville Bonner in 1971 to our nation's parliament, the first Indigenous Australian to serve in the Australian parliament. If ever you get the opportunity, go to the old museum at the parliament, the old parliament, and read his diary entry. He has a pillow on display and the diary entry says, I was never invited to any event, to any function. At the end of a day, I'd leave my office, go home to my trusted friend, my pillow, and would lay my head down to rest. Eddie Marbo's fight and victory for native title and land rights, and of course, Vincent Lingari's Wave Hill walk-off and a strike which led to the Native Land Rights Act in 1976. These significant achievements shifted the pendulum positively. However, this hasn't always meant the pendulum stayed that way. While we have succeeded in some areas, in others we have not. Looking forward, we must address where we have failed. <coughs> Excuse me where we have failed to permanently shift the pendulum on fundamental disadvantage with Indigenous Australia on factors such as the basic right to an education, the value of a full-time job, access uniformly to health care, and the need to address alarming rates of suicide and mental illness in our community, and much, much more. As I stand here tonight looking forward I am optimistic about the opportunities that lie ahead for us and equally as realistic about the challenges we must overcome. As we embark on this journey, I am above all else wanting to have and encourage conversations across this nation. Through these conversations, we become more comfortable with each other, our shared past, present and future. Truth-telling to me, is not a contest of histories. It's an understanding of history. It's an acceptance that there can be shared stories around events in our nation's history. 
I recently spoke with an elderly woman who expressed her dismay that her childhood and education hadn't featured the stories or history of Indigenous Australians. In particular, she spoke about learning of massacres later in life and used the words to say that she had been lied to as a child. I responded by saying that she wasn't lied to, but she didn't hear or had the opportunity to hear about our history through our eyes. This is why we share and we need to share our history because it is important that the history of this nation is parallel to the events that have occurred. It is not about guilt. It is about acknowledging that there were events that occurred. And we need to acknowledge that people will come to this debate from various angles and perceptions of history. None of this is wrong or should be dismissed or discouraged. We cannot simply tell our truth, a truth through yelling. It must be done through conversation. For me, one of the most indelible moments that sparked a national conversation was that in December 1992, when the then Prime Minister, Paul Keating, delivered what is now known as the Redfern speech. I had the fortune of being there. The crowd was electrified and noised charged with energy and emotion. I remember a bunch of balloons in the colours of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags bobbed on the roof above Keating's head and children dressed in red as they sat on the grass at the foot of the stage, trying to keep still but mostly failing. Keating's words that day have entered the history books. So did that speech. The words most often quoted are his accounting of the deeds of non-Aboriginal Australians. He said, we took the traditional lands and we smashed the traditional way of life. We bought the diseases, the alcohol, and we committed the murders. But it was the next line that caused the strongest reaction from the audience and you couldn't miss it. We took the children from their mothers. Those seven words drew a loud outburst from the crowd. It was raw emotion. Yet it was both positive and negative. But most of all, it was a significant moment of truth-telling by none other than our nation's Prime Minister of the day. That shifted the pendulum. And from that shift in 2008, we saw Prime Minister Kevin Rudd issue an apology on behalf of the Commonwealth Government to the Stolen Generations. And any one of us here tonight can probably remember where we were, who we were with, and the way in which we watched that speech being delivered. But the reactions that was portrayed on the screens of the tears running down the faces of those who were most affected. And that a sense of relief became a glaringly obvious moment based on the fact that the truth of the past had been acknowledged. Whilst this was regarded by some as merely a symbolic gest gesture, as of 2015, the fact is that there are an estimated 13,800 surviving Indigenous Australians aged 50 and over who have been removed from their families and communities and considered part of the stolen generation. The healing that resulted from this act of truth-telling cannot be quantified. And whilst this took time, it does demonstrate that truth-telling today can lead to significant moments of reconciliation in the future. If we walk together and acknowledge our shared history, we can achieve permanent positive change. Truth-telling is not best served by a national commission or similar interrogation of truth. We all should know detailed stories of the areas in which we lived, all Australians sharing the one history. I personally would rather see an organic and evolving truth-telling in which we share our stories, our acknowledgement of the events of the past, but the way in which we, as a nation of people, are melding together for a better future. 
there has to be local storing of history of the past, and it must be local. Otherwise, we gloss over those very elements that are important within country, within region. And we will only tend to focus on the national stories. Every story to do with our country is as equally important as the national stories. Around kitchen tables, over the barbecue and in the backyard, down at the local football or netball club, and in pubs. This is where permanent change will come from, not from the loud voices in Canberra and the media. The 2018 Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition heard this firsthand and reported the following. A large number of stakeholders agreed that truth-telling is best implemented at local and regional levels. A key component of this local truth-telling is the fact that we must be comfortable having these conversations. And comfortability is a two-way street. For Indigenous Australians, it means having the ability to speak our truth and have it heard. And for those seeking to understand, we must allow them to ask questions and contribute to the rigour of the conversation, whilst at all times maintaining respect for one another. Until this happens, we won't see the shift in the pendulum that we want to see and achieve. Importantly, truth-telling is also an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of Indigenous Australians. We must stand proud and celebrate the progress we've made. Too often, the pictures painted are that of setback and failure, which simply reinforces the negative elements of our history. I want us to lead in a positive manner. I want us all to lead in a positive manner. And I want to celebrate our successes and champion those who achieve and do great things. In sport, we do that exceptionally well. We acknowledge Ash Barty, we acknowledge Cathy Freeman, and many of our high-level achieving sportsmen and women. But we also need to do it for the things that we achieve personally, those matters that we achieve as a community. But as equally important is the success of a child at each stage of schooling. And I'm not talking about achieving significant reform here, which is certainly important. What I'm referring to is the kid who didn't finish school getting their first job and keeping it, and finding themselves contributing to their community. We need to celebrate every child who goes to school and receives an education, the foundation of a more meaningful and purposeful life. These quiet achievements are as much about what defines Indigenous Australia in 2019 as the differences. We all too often allow those differences to divide us. Looking forward to our opportunity to shift the pendulum, let's talk about constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Whilst the Constitution belongs to all Australians, it is important for the purpose that the conversations I've spoken about tonight are so critical in achieving what we set out to do. As I've said before, this is too important to rush and it's too important to get wrong. On eight occasions, the Australian people have voted for change to our founding document. The Constitution is like the rule book for sport, but it is the rule book of our nation. On 36 other occasions, they have been lost. And there are 36, 36 issues that have not come back to the Australian people to consider again in a referendum. The most recent example of this being the 1999 Republic and Preamble referendum, a campaign that saw a rift in our nation's fabric and a result where not a single state carried a yes vote and often forgotten is that the fact that the vote on the preamble was rejected by a greater margin than the question of the Republic. This is not to say we can't achieve constitutional recognition within the term of this parliament. But it is important that we learn from the 1999 referendum, sorry, referendum and reflect on how challenging it can be to translate goodwill into a positive outcome. 
Looking back to 1967 and the referendum put forward by the coalition Holt government, 90.77% of Australians voted to embrace our people as part of Australia. Key to this was bipartisan support. The simplicity of the question and a clear purpose for holding the referendum. I want to be very clear. The question we put to the Australian people will not result in what some desire, and that is an enshrined voice to the parliament. On these two matters, whilst related, they needed to be treated separately. This is about recognising Indigenous Australians on our birth certificate. And I'll talk to the voice later on. When I was elected in 2010, I was appointed to the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. We held public conversations in 84 urban, regional and remote locations and in every capital city, as well as the hundreds of meetings and around 3,500 submissions were received. From this, the panel reported to government in 2012 and subsequently, we had three more reports to government on the same matter. Each of these reports have looked at a set of words to put to the Australian people. The words are there in those documents. Our challenge now is finding a way forward that will result in the majority of Australians in the majority of states overwhelmingly supporting constitutional recognition. We must be pragmatic. The Constitution belongs to all Australians, from those in Slim's hometown of Kempsey to those in my childhood town of Corrigan. No one of us can lay claim to the Constitution. It belongs to us collectively. And it belongs to those who came before us, and most importantly, it'll belong to our children and our grandchildren. I'm not thinking about what I can achieve for myself or concerned about my legacy. I'm focused on realising recognition for my children, your children and generations to come. Let me challenge the loudest voices in this debate. Now is our opportunity to do this and it will require understanding and tolerance of all views. If we don't seize the opportunity now, it may be lost for all time. We must not allow this to happen. So I invite you to walk with all Australians on this journey. It's not about walking with me or walking the path of any one individual. It's about walking in the footsteps of those who've come before us to create a path and a new path for all Australians. This is not an issue that can be viewed through the prism of political ideologies and all Australian politics have a way to go. I ask my colleagues from all sides to remember what is your first duty as a member of parliament, and that is to listen to and represent the views of your community. There is a lot of work to do on this journey. We haven't had a referendum since 1999, and we must educate a new generation on the importance of constitution and the significance of the change we are asking for. This will require all of us to lay the foundation through education and conversation. That is the first step. I had a young Australian ask me the other day when to expect their ballot to arrive in the mail to post back and wanted to be part of this change. I had to explain to her the difference between the recent postal plebiscite to recognise same-sex marriage and the difference between what a referendum is and how it works. Having these conversations are as important as the conversations we have about why we need to recognise Indigenous Australians in the Constitution and demonstrates the steps we need to consider to achieve this. Let's start these conversations, which may seem very basic to us, but they are very important in realising success. The pendulum will shift, but it's up to us to determine which way. Let me now turn to voice and being heard. Having your voice heard is going to look very different to how your neighbour sees their voice being heard. In Australia today, there are almost 800,000 Indigenous voices, all of equal importance and relevance. Therein lies the complexity of defining a voice. The voice is multi-layered and multi-dimensional. I see rooted in our elders 
who are the basis for our knowledge, culture and law, and rooted in our communities and extending through the ways in which all levels of governments, service providers and corporations engage and work with our people. Too often I visit communities and I'm told that their voice isn't being heard because needs are not being met on the ground. And we certainly heard that at Gama for those who were in attendance. And others who say they want their local member of parliament to hear their voice. How we give voice to these Australians is through conversation and understanding. Knowing what is happening, knowing what needs to happen and work with leaders and individuals within our communities to develop the practical solutions that see a shift in the pendulum at the most local of levels. Having these voices heard is not only a matter for the Commonwealth Government, it's a matter for state and territories, local governments and service providers. That's why I've tasked the National Indigenous Agency with changing the way they engage to ensure that the priority is meeting the needs of local communities first. I'm often asked about the commitment of the Morrison government, but let me assure you that the Morrison government is committed to a co-design process so that we ensure we have the best possible framework in place to hear those voices at the local, regional and national level. More will be said in the months to come, and much like constitutional recognition, it's too important to rush or to get wrong. This is about ensuring Indigenous voices are heard as, as loudly as any other Australian voices. Again, this is a journey for all Australians to walk. And through conversations, we must respect and understand and address all perspectives on this matter. Giving voice to Indigenous Australians and realising constitutional recognition are the greatest opportunities in our lifetime, but they're not mutually exclusive. This must, this must be remembered if we are to shift the pendulum. But what about shifting the pendulum tomorrow? There are things that we can be doing as individuals, as parts of organisations and as members of communities to positively shift the pendulum. Don't think that any one action you can take won't lead to meaningful change. The individual actions of those here tonight let alone those across the nation, has the potential to improve and the lives and the outcomes for our people. We can all shift the pendulum. And that's what I'm focused on every single day. I'll be judged as equally in, on my ability and this government's ability to create jobs, improve access to health care, have young people attend school and succeed, reduce suicide rates, as I will be delivering on constitutional recognition. And this is what drives me. Every Indigenous Australian who finds a job, every young person that gets to school in the morning, every prevented suicide, and instances of otitis media, for example, being treated is what I'll celebrate. And that's something you should celebrate too. It's something you can have a direct impact on. How do you play a role in shifting the pendulum? Consider that proposition tonight and leave here motivated to shift the pendulum for one person, one family, one community or more. Many of you will be doing that already, so the question becomes, how can we grow and share that? How can we celebrate that? We must look at what we do and the good that we have the potential for, and then to share these successes as loudly and widely as possible. By celebrating success, we're not blinding ourselves to the challenges at hand or dismissing the levels of disadvantage within, within Australian Indigenous communities. We know that people are dying earlier. We know that our people are committing suicide. We know that children are being born into a lifetime of poverty. And that's on us as well. I don't discount or diminish this in any way. We owe it to our children and to the future generations to come to create an environment and culture of opportunity and of positivity so that when an Indigenous Australian child is born, they see the world where their dreams can be realised and where each day is filled with hope and optimism, where the face they see in the mirror doesn't limit their aspirations, where the face they see in the mirror is the face they see reading the five o'clock news, the face they see exploring space 
or one day the face they see leading our nation. To achieve this future, we must change how we look at ourselves and we must have others view, have others view Indigenous Australians through our successes and not our failings. Just as disadvantage should not be viewed through colour, success should not be limited by colour. I asked what we can do tomorrow to shift the pendulum. Well, start by celebrating success, by sharing success and by ensuring that one person's success today is the hope for someone else's success tomorrow. But to em emphasise the importance of acting and listening at the local level, I want to take us back to the 1967 referendum. As the referendum votes were being tallied and the nation's yes vote was starting to emerge, Vincent Lingiari, a Gurindji man and his stockman, were several months in their famous Wave Hill walk off and strike. The strike, although initially an employee's rights action, had soon become a national issue as the relationship between Indigenous Australians and the wider community and our national idioms were once again being challenged. The strike lasted eight years and that eventually led to the Native Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976. This shifted the pendulum, legislating the right for Indigenous people in the Northern Territory to negotiate over any developments on their lands. Ningyari's actions at the local level culminated in the Prime Minister Gough Whitlam pouring the red dirt of our land through the hands of Vincent. Whilst this act was symbolic, it put in train a series of events that defines the land rights movement to this day. The courage shown by Lingiari was not only for him, but for future generations as recognised by what Whitlam said. I'm truly humbled to be here in front of you delivering the 19th annual Vincent Lingari Memorial Lecture. And I thank James Dar Charles Darwin's university for the opportunity to contribute to this series of lectures, which has helped in its own way be a form of truth telling and spark the conversations that we've needed since 1996. To be in the company of such distinguished voices truly is an honour. I don't want not tonight to be about me, but if I could just take one moment to say the significance of being appointed the first Indigenous Minister for Indigenous Australians is not lost on me. And I thank the Gurindri people for their faith and for their commitment. And I will certainly walk with you to, live, to deliver on the things that are important for our people, but I will walk with our people right across this nation and other Australians. For young Indigenous Australians out there across this great nation, dreaming of a career in politics, I hope that my journey can give you hope. Many of you here know my journey, but let me just share it with you again for that young person who's hearing it from me for the first time tonight. I was born in 1952 and raised in Rowlands Mission near Bunbury in Western Australia and am the oldest of 10 children. My father was a railway ganger, my mother was a member of the Stolen Generation and we lived in a tiny place called Nanine just west of Mekathara. My schooling at first was by correspondence working a radio with a foot pedal like an old sewing machine for two hours at a time. Soon afterwards my parents moved to Corrigan. Education was my turning point. And by going to school, my drive for knowledge and desire to learn is something that I retain and value today. I have a few other fragments of memory from when I was a skinny ankled kid running around Corrigan. There was a time that some people in our town started circulating a petition to get the Aboriginal family that was, had moved in kicked out. The petition failed. The townspeople wanted us to stay and have a fair go. I also remember a time when I was 10 years old and somebody said to me, you might end up being a politician one day. And I thought, not in this country will I ever have that opportunity. As I grew into a teenager in the mid 60s, I became enterprising. I worked on farms, I'd catch rabbits, sell the meat to the butcher, uh, certainly not the ones I bruised, I cooked those, and I sold the skins as well. I used to work on farms, I'd earn money by chopping wood, doing fencing, driving tractors, doing harvesting, but it gave me money for myself and I kept half my earnings to buy a few things and put away some in the bank. The other half I'd give to my mother to help put food on the table for all of us. This is not a sub story. To me, it sort of felt like freedom. 
It gave me a sense of personal responsibility and an attitude of enterprising thinking. Those experiences living in a country town probably shaped me. While I was busy skinning rabbits and making a buck, Australia was growing and changing. I hope collectively we can fulfil the expectation I feel each day to continue to grow and shape a better future for all Indigenous Australians and continue the healing of our nation. I know I don't walk alone, but I also acknowledge there are many expectations placed on me and I feel the weight of that expectation. But I want to take this weight and turn it into optimism for what we can achieve together when we swing the pendulum. And I'll repeat again, everything I've spoken about tonight from truth telling to constitutional recognition is too important to rush and too important to get wrong. I need everyone in this room and all of those out there who want to succeed to ask yourselves, what can I do to help us realise our goals? What are you going to do to shift that pendulum? What are you going to do tomorrow? In three months' time and in a year's time? Goodwill, while important, will not allow us to complete this journey and positively shift that pendulum. How can we elevate our successes? How can we give voice to those who feel voiceless? And how can we make sure their voices are heard as loudly as those who come from Canberra and in the media? I want you to remember these words from Vincent Lingiari. Let us live happily together as mates. Let us not make it hard for each other. We want to live in a better way together, Aboriginal and white men. Let us not fight over anything. Let us be mates. Let this be the basis for conversations we have and remember those important words of uh, Vincent Lingiari. Take stock every so often and ask yourself, are your actions working for or against shifting the pendulum? On any of the measures we've discussed tonight or on any other significant measures through which we define success and progress? Let's remember the importance of learning, listening and understanding when we look back and through this we'll be able to look forward. Look forward and walk toward, sorry, look forward and work towards realising local truth telling, constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians, giving voice to our local communities and addressing disadvantage in Indigenous Australians. Together we can shift the pendulum, help every child out there realise their dreams and leave a more unified, understanding and tolerant Australian for generations to come. Success for me will be to look back after all is said and done and be able to say as Slim once sang, we've done us proud to come this far down through the years to where we are, side by side, hand in hand. We've lived and died for this great land. We've done us proud. Let's walk together. Let us shift the pendulum together. I thank you for the privilege of being with you here this evening. Thank you. Looking forward, looking forward.